Hi, pals. After powering through the holidays and finishing off Season 3, we had our rundown episodes looking back at how great Season 3 was. Then we also had our big announcement that we are launching a brand new Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. This week, we wanted to re-air or reissue what we think is our best episode from season three it's not the best episode of miami vice by a long shot but we do think that this is the best episode of go with the heat from season three so sorry for a rerun this week before we start season four but we really felt that we can put our best foot forward and give maybe some new people who have found the show now a classic episode of go with the heat we're gonna be back next week kicking off season four that is considered to be the downturn as you know we don't take that lightly and we are huge miami vice fans now even though in the beginning we had never seen an episode before so this week we wanted to show what our classic episode was and we're really looking forward to the start of season four. We really appreciate you listening to the show too. We would love to hear your feedback. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Check out the website, go with the heat.com. Click on contact us. You can find all the ways to get a hold of us. Also, be sure to check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We would love to have your support. So please go check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat for as little as $1. Just one little old measly dollar doesn't even get you a little Cuban coffee in Miami. You can support your pals at Go With The Heat and let us grow into the podcast network that we want to be. Check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. And now, without much further ado, I give you Season 3, Episode 4, titled Walk Alone. This was Go With The Heat, Episode number 53. This is the one that we had some of the most fun with. This is the episode where we get the fantastic line, you've been chumping around on me. So here it is, Season 3, Episode 4, Walk Alone. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 4, titled Walk Alone. It originally premiered on October 17th, 1986. It was written by a man named W.K. Scott Meyer, which the only this is the only episode that he wrote for Miami Vice. But he did some work for NYPD Blue. He wrote for, he was an editor for Party of Five, which is funny because we were talking about Party of Five. We were talking about that earlier today. (laughs) The director is David Jackson. Now, we know David Jackson. David Jackson wrote and directed the episode Stone's War, and he also directed French Twist. Oh, (laughs) that explains a lot of things then. (laughs) I don't want to give too much away, but I think consistently we thought this episode was pretty ridiculous. Yeah. (laughs) Before we get started, I can check in on each other's lives. Guys, we record the show on Sunday. I've mentioned it many times. And then we publish on Fridays. The Tonight on HBO, the premiere of season seven of Game of Thrones came on. So if you haven't watched it, I'm a dump the entire episode of game of thrones right now because i watched it just because i hate the show but i watched it just to give spoilers <laughs> so in the beginning becky comes back from the bar and she's like earl you should have seen what jesse was doing while she was there she <laughs> said <laughs> <laughs> no i did not watch the first episode of season of season seven of game of thrones but as i indicated i don't have i don't have any plans to watch season seven of game of thrones but john it sounds like you've dedicated much of your life this weekend to game of thrones i am a game game of thrones fan but i'm not been a fan to pay for hbo <laughs> so <I'm> also cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes so my cable provider uh provided me with free hbo this weekend so I had an opportunity to catch up on all I missed in season six. So I am ah. currently 10 hours deep, just gotten through <laughs> season six. And I'm so ready to watch the first episode, but kind of bittersweet knowing that I'm not going to be able to watch the next nine until they give me free <laughs> HBO again. I have to wait until next year when they give me the free. <laughs> yes. So I just got to avoid, you know, all social media for the next uh, year. <laughs> the next nine months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no biggie <laughs> i'm happy that i don't have to worry about that but man the people like john that you binge watching an entire season in a single weekend I, that's like a standing clap like for people who are able to accomplish that i can't get i can't binge watch anything i get two episodes in and i'm like i'm bored 
I could do it if we didn't have kids. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're holding me back from my binge watching. <laughs> the, the, that's the trick. That's the trick. The, don't reproduce. You can binge watch all you want. That's the perk. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you, though, it is more difficult to do that with pay cable or Netflix shows. Because mm -hmm. when they say an hour, they actually mean an hour. There's not like 15 minutes of commercials that you can fast forward through. Yeah, it's know? on a 40 minute episode. No, it's, it's really an it's, hour. It's yeah. really an hour. Yes. Well, speaking of hour long episodes, this one sure felt like it was the full hour. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about the time Tubbs went to jail and Izzy was a stripper. <laughs> All right, I have a major problem with this opening, and I haven't said that about an episode of Vice in a long time, but this opening covers quite the gamut of scenes. We start off with Tubbs greasing up the bed sheets. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, dude, a Tubbs, a Tubbs sex scene to start off the episode, like, I totally wasn't prepared for that. Like, you need to <laughs> ease me into these scenes. It ruined the spaghetti I was eating. <laughs> <laughs> I had to just throw it all out. <laughs> Not only that, but doing my show prep, I noticed that Laura, who plays his girlfriend, wasn't credited in the episode. So once again, that's a little pet peeve of mine, not um, knowing who she is. Yeah, yeah. especially since um, what happens in the episode. Like, yeah, what? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and, and immediately right off the bat, it's like, well, now I really want to know who Laura is. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why didn't you credit her? What happened? Did Tubbs really sleep with her? Is that what really happened? No, <laughs> this is the part that this scene I will go back to in my final thoughts to this series where I stand by that this should have been a two-part episode. This would have been an amazing two-part episode. And it goes back to this very beginning scene because we see Tubbs with Laura and there's no backstory on Laura. Laura's just there. Yeah. And man, if this was a two-part episode and you get some backstory on who Laura is, then this is big investigation. Then she gets killed, and they decide to put Tubbs in jail, and then have a second episode of just Tubbs in jail. This would have been a fantastic two-parter. But you did get background. They've been dating for two weeks. That's all you need to know. <laughs> for two weeks, he's been walking around like he's on cloud nine, according to his white tech. What is with these vice characters and their significant others immediately involving them in drug deals? Uh, you know? <laughs> True, right? Like, why would you even? I'd be like, yeah. oh. <laughs> After we see them talking in bed, and it's clear they did some real dirty stuff based on the conversation <laughs> that they're having in bed, <laughs> the screen fades to come back to Switex face. So thank you, Miami Vice. Yeah, I know. We go Sexy from naked time? tubs to Switex face. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about that he sees Tubbs singing over his shoulder. He's talking about that if Tubbs is getting serious about a woman, he should come talk to him, come talk to Switex first before he gets in too deep. Yeah, that's, yeah, because he's got so many women, he doesn't know what to do with them. So is, the is that to tell? Does Tubbs sing whenever he gets laid? Like, <laughs> like, is that like, like, ah, oh, damn, he's singing again. He must be getting nooky. <laughs> Tubbs gets a call. It's Laura. She says something about this, this guy that's got some keys. And he drops one of my favorite lines. This, uh, And I was mentioning it before we started recording. My two favorite things that Tubbs has ever taught me is two quotes. One of them is this. He says, kiss yourself for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be using that all the time. No, you're not. We won't be on the other end. The rest end. of the time, for, forever, Melissa, when you talk to Dominic on the phone, he's going to say that at the end of every conversation. <laughs> I'm just going to set up a keyboard shortcut. This yeah, message <laughs> for <yeah>. texting. <laughs> every time I do something for him, kiss yourself for me, honey. <laughs> Crockett comes over and says, hey, we got to go check in on this thing. It doesn't matter what it is because Tubbs is like, we need to make a stop first. We're going to go see Laura. And he's like, dang it. <laughs> Crockett's like, dang it. I don't want to go see that lady again. <laughs> So they go over to the club. She points out the guy that is talking about keys. The Crockett approaches him, flashes his badge. The guy tries to get up and run, but the cocaine, two keys of cocaine, fall out of his briefcase. It's the most convenient drug bust ever. <laughs> You're talking about it in yeah. the open. You have a faulty briefcase, and you've got two keys in your briefcase. It just falls right out. You know, and I worry about any drug dealer that orders a salad. <laughs> Especially that guy. He and he's not eating any salads. Yeah, he looks like a salad type. No. <laughs> His story is fantastic, too. He They ask him who he's doing a deal with, and he says he's doing a meeting with Carlo Ar Amati because he's got a connection with a man named Izzy Moreno, the, the bullfighter 
Izzy Moreno. And also the guy's name is Pink, too. Yeah. That's yeah. another thing. That's his real name, too. Yeah. That's not his code yeah. name. <laughs> code name yes. Pink. Played by Frank Cassini, where you can also see him, the fantastic movie Time Cop. It's an amazing movie. <laughs> <laughs> it taught me so much about if I'm going to be electrocuted, how to do the splits <laughs> on the counter. <laughs> hey, that man can teach you so much about the splits. <laughs> he can still do them too. Don't get me started on that. That could be a whole other. Tubbs is in shock that they that he has a meeting with Amadi. Amadi is a big get. He's someone that they've been working towards a long time. So Crockett's like, "Don't do anything stupid. We're gonna go sit at the table next door. Use keep your deal." Amadi comes walking in. He comes walking up. And he's like, "You pink." Like, yeah, this is for my brother. And then a shootout begins. I mean, as if Vice team should have known what was coming here. Well, they're involved. So, you know, there's a shootout coming. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to plan things? Don't you just instead of just like, hey, you know, we we, we caught a drug dealer uh, in a restaurant eating a salad. Let, let's turn this into a drug sting. <laughs> yeah, you think they could you, you know, just it's, like it's... watched it or something like let it happen. Watch mm-hmm. it happen. Like, okay, this is for real. This is the deal. But I guess like, that's probably what they were going to do. And then he shot him. So maybe yeah, that's yeah, the shootout starts right away. Yeah, so I guess true, maybe you have All the benefit right. of the doubt. Just... They were there at the, the very salad. Least, at the very least, Crockett could have played Burnett and replaced them eating a salad. Yeah, that's true. He didn't know who Pink was. True. Okay, yeah. so now we're thinking of <laughs> Now we're thinking of <laughs> Now we're thinking like Vice Cops should be. <laughs> well, not Switek. <laughs> so Amadi's dead. Pink is dead. Oh, no, sorry. Amadi's still alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amadi has survived, but he's down. Pink is dead. Amadi's bodyguard is dead. You look over and you see that Laura, the only bystander in the restaurant that gets hit, she is hit by a stray bullet during the shootout. And then we go to the opening credits. I just want to point out something here. I had to go back and rewatch this scene because I am not totally convinced that Pink's the one that shot Laura. So Amadi pulls his gun out and fires at Pink. Pink shoots like three random shots. And then Crockett jumps up and fires at least two shots. Mm. Someone test Crockett's gun. I think Crockett <laughs> shot Laura. Yeah, but I think what they were trying to say is that they said the bullets were flying everywhere. So they never said who shot her. Because they also have you also have Amadi's bodyguard firing and probably Tubbs firing. Mm-hmm. You don't show it. When, they, we, th- when we come back from the credits, Crockett is trying to convince Castillo that it was Pink the one that was shooting around. <laughs> no, I mean, they're no, all, yeah, wild, he was man, the one yeah, I think you're yeah, trying to like, falsely please, accuse don't... Crockett right now, and I don't like it. <laughs> what are you, like, IAD? Castillo, you know we don't need to test them? my gun. It was Wild <laughs> Bill Crockett. <laughs> well, we all know John would be the I... snitch. <laughs> oh, I'm just saying, I, I, I think Crockett may be a little jealous of Tubbs' girlfriend. <laughs> he shot to take her, her out. <laughs> Well, yeah, when we come back from the opening credits, we see that Laura has died. So Tubbs has once again lost his girlfriend. What did I tell you? I told you he's never going to be happy again. (laughs) They hate him. It's like the writers hate these men. They don't want them ever to have happiness. (laughs) (laughs) They also find out that Mr. Pink wasn't just a dealer, but he's also a guard at Bolton State Prison. So he's this is an inside deal. This is uh, a Miami, a member of the Miami prison guards that is dealing in drugs so now this goes deep not just that tub's girlfriend got well, killed. i mean that's the most you know <laughs> for vice normally that's enough for them to get involved even when it's outside of their jurisdiction even outside of the country yeah. that's enough for I mean, them to get on. involved <laughs> when we leave from the club we go to another club and this time we go to raul's and raul's it's ladies night and there's male strippers on stage the ladies are having a lot of fun in the crowd lots of cheering there is a man in his speedo dancing on stage with a cowboy hat the B team has shown up and they're wanting to go talk to Izzy because Izzy is the one that coordinated this deal or as far as they know. (laughs) So they feel that they're going to find Izzy here. The B team comes and sits down. They turn to their left and who comes dancing out on stage, but Izzy Moreno. (laughs) Wearing some silver pants. (laughs) And my first thought is who the heck is paying to see Izzy dance? Are they giving him like quarters and dimes or what? <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese coins. <laughs> the ladies in the crowd seem to be having a fantastic time. With they like Izzy. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's like, he sees the B team. He's like, hey, are you guys here to appreciate my air guitar? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, we didn't know you did it. <laughs> 
what the B team wants to know is how, why is Izzy involved in this? And Izzy comes clean. He says, uh, Amadi came to him and he came to him to set up the deal with Pink. He didn't know what was going to happen. All he knows is that that deal, that Amadi wanted that set up and that Amadi's brother, Giacomo, is in prison. So what he thought was is that he wa- that Amadi wanted the guards at Bolton State Prison to be easy on his brother while he's there. But in more important news, Izzy is just making $10 an hour stripping for <laughs> ladies night at Raul's and he is loving it and he is working it too. Credit to Izzy all the time. Whenever he gets a job, he works his ass off, whether it's stealing cement trucks, <laughs> dog racing. <laughs> <laughs> but really, though, if he's making ten dollars an hour, isn't he only making like twenty dollars? Because how many hours can you strip? <laughs> I mean, like ladies, I only last for maybe three hours, four hours tops. He's making forty bucks. <laughs> My favorite part in this isn't just is he stripping, but at the very end, he has some tearaway pants and he rips them off and he's wearing like this cheetah print leggings he's wearing more pants like <laughs> and what essence is he a stripper then because the other guy had a speedo on and 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 chaps okay yeah. <laughs> the other thing that i love about this scene is that the b team wants to pay izzy for his information and he's like put it in the belt <laughs> <laughs> put it in my pants <laughs> and they like stick it on his forehead like no Back at the precinct, Tubbs, Crockett comes walking in. Zito's leaving. He tells Crockett, like, hey, I think Tubbs has been here all night. Crockett goes over to the room, and Tubbs has put has already put together the entire case. He's a mid-level dealer. He's locked up at Bolton State Prison, and he got shot and killed. And there was no investigative reports. No, The only witnesses were other prisoners and the, pri- say anything. And the prison guards, and no one said anything. So it looks very suspicious. Yeah. But Crockett's like, I hear you, but I think you should take a few weeks off. Like... Maybe you should get on my boat and just go cruise around to a montage around the Keys. <laughs> just the fact Crockett saying that it's getting too personal is kind of the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> like at, at, at this point, Crockett would have already beaten someone up, and because I mean he doesn't do any like the paper folders type stuff. So I mean. <laughs> He would have beaten someone up at this point, driven his car around, thrown around some weight. Rolled around in the dirt at the shooting range. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But God forbid Tubbs take this one a little personal because, you know, they killed his girlfriend. That he was dating for two weeks. What about the one who had a kid with? (laughs) Well, come on. I mean, remember the the airplane stewardess? Uh, yeah, I know. He took her pretty hard, even though he was, like, seeing her on the weekends for, like, a week. No, I'm <laughs> yeah. I saw her two weekends in a row. It was a serious relationship. <laughs> Before the conversation can end, Zito pops back in and says Castillo wants to see them both at Mercy Hospital. So off they go to the hospital where Amadi is. When they show up, Castillo and then the commissioner of prisons. And he is, believe it or not, Ron Perlman. The Beast. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I know, man. <laughs> Sons of Anarchy, Pacific Rim, Hellboy, Beauty and the Beast. That Ron Perlman is in this episode. Alien Resurrection, Star Trek Nemesis. So let's talk about Ron Perlman for a minute. He got his Master's in Fine Arts from the University of Minnesota in 1973. You know, lots of good actors come out of Minnesota. <laughs> we got nothing else to do there. <laughs> <laughs> so he debuted on a soap opera called Ryan's Hope. Oh my god, that's a long time ago. <laughs> that show's been off uh-huh. the air for so long. Yeah, and then he was in Beauty and the Beast, the TV series from 87 to 90 with Linda Hamilton. And then he also did a lot of animated voiceover acting. Bonkers, Batman, Animaniac, Aladdin, wow. The Little Mermaid, Mortal Kombat. The Tick, Teen Damn. Titans, Justice League, Kim Possible, and the Star Wars Clone Wars show. Really? Now you're interested. Now in- I'm listening. I loved that show. Well, so, nothing against course. Animaniacs. You just saying. Or any of the other great shows you just listed, <laughs> like Justice League. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, and then you've already mentioned he was in the Hellboy movies and all of the other stuff. I mean, Sons of Anarchy for me is always going to be Ron Perlman. It is hard. Even though he's been in all that other stuff, I still see him as Beast. I know what I was going to say. He's, he's still Beauty and the Beast for me. 
<laughs> well, they step into another room, and what he lays out is is that there is something suspicious happening at Bolton State Prison. They don't know how far up it goes. They're looking for someone to infiltrate the prison and bring down this ring of crooked guards that are inside of the prison. What they know is that it's all happening in the D block, and it all involves a guard named Fox. But they don't know how high it goes, so they can't trust any of the other guards there. They need to send someone else. They have an idea to send a rookie, and Tubbs is like, "Nah, nah, this is vice work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in and, and infiltrate yeah. this prison." He's basically like, "Why would you send a rookie when you can send a star?" That's what he says. Like, <laughs> why would well, you send a teacher? Yeah. yeah, there you go. There you go. He's got it. Yeah, like a teacher. Yeah, there you go. Like, why, why would you do that when you're gonna send in me, like mm-hmm. the apprentice? You could send me in, you know. He also says that he hasn't sent anyone to Bolton State Prison. So no one in there this should know him. Terrible now, cop. <laughs> the last I checked, the Miami Vice aren't exactly the best undercover cops. And it, going See, to a it's... state prison. <laughs> also, we, me and Dominic talked about it. Like, how does he know? Like, yeah, so maybe you've never. And he knows where everyone's gone that he's ever arrested. No, no there's no way. Second of all, yeah, maybe <laughs> no, they didn't no, go no, to no. Bolton, See, but they didn't get. How do you know See, they didn't get transferred? Yeah. <laughs> like, what? The <laughs> trick is. The trick is, if you kill everyone instead of arresting them, <laughs> true. they never go to prison. Well, it's true because they really no have only notion. sent like three people to prison this whole time. And one of them committed yes. suicide in front of Crockett. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so maybe like only like one and a half people are in there. <laughs> so I also want to point out, Ron Perlman looks fantastic with his mustache and his perm. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't want to insult the man. He's very strange looking. <laughs> Crockett does not take the news that Tubbs is willing to sign up for this, willing to volunteer very well. He's like, D- you have to be cold to go into the joint. And you're red hot, pal. <laughs> Sorry. That whole- so for for, hey, for once, he was right, lungs. though. He was right, though. Okay. Yeah. For the record. <laughs> I just love the comment. Someone's going to, uh, someone might stick you with a pencil in the lung. <laughs> he's like they'll stick him he can't be in there longer than or whatever it's like well, it's two make days you. he's gonna be there for two days yeah he's like don't they'll, they'll make you in two minutes yeah stick you in the lung that's all it'll take <laughs> damn they're not gonna make him didn't you hear ron perlman in 45 minutes he'll have an airtight cover <laughs> even your own you'll, yeah you won't be able to get out of a speeding ticket if only i could think of one person that consistently messes up people's covers Hmm. hmm. We'll come back to that one. <laughs> <laughs> the best part is, is Castillo has his look on his face. He's like, "You guys are fucking embarrassing me. Let's go home." Yeah, he's like, "We could talk about this in my office later." <laughs> Dad is not happy. <laughs> no one is going for ice cream after this. It's not good. <laughs> There's a quick scene back at the precinct. The deal are discussing. Tubbs is saying he's the right man. Again, Crockett's, Crockett's like, no. <laughs> yeah, he's strongly against it. Castillo says this Crockett for two days. Crockett needs to back his partner up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think Castillo was like uncharacteristically, like hey, he didn't care. Hey, hey, Castillo is taking it personal the entire way. Castillo is the one that sacrifices himself at the end of this episode, too. That is true. So in all his sweaty glory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was pretty sweaty. <laughs> Switek and Zito is going to give him the layout. So that's where we go next. We're going to go over to this library. I think he like works. I don't know. I don't know what the <laughs> hell he's doing. I don't know. Why does it look like a prison library, but he's out of prison? So this is where the episode ceases being a Miami Vice episode and starts being really, really weird. Well, I mean, there's a one-eyed man stacking the books. <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, is ex-con? The B team's there. They're talking. His name is Carl. Our one-eyed man name is Carl. <laughs> And they want played by played by Michael Earl Reed, who was also in the fantastic movie Army of Darkness. Yes. Anytime, anytime the chin Bruce Campbell is involved, it is fantastic. He's got a man crush on him. (laughs) So I mean I think we can pretty much just sum this scene up in that Carl's pretty much just teaching Zwitek and Zito the joint politic. (laughs) You know, there's the Aryans, there's the Brotherhood. If you teach a guy to read, you can join his gang. Um, that's always important. He'll protect you. But first you have to go yes. around and, and assume that nobody can read, right? Like go up to people like, can you read? <laughs> no. <laughs> also, also apparently Texas prisons are country clubs, which I'm sure people in Texas would disagree. Because yeah. um, he knows what every prison is like. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe he does. So <laughs> maybe he's been a lot. <laughs> and you're right, John. This can boil down to that. They just want help from Carl because he knows someone named Samson. 
who can help give Tubbs yes. protection and provide information to him while he's inside the prison. Again, it's only for 48 hours, so it's just for a very short window. They would be willing to bargain with Samson to help get him out early. Yeah, yeah. Go to get a parole hearing early yeah. is what they would do. So now we go to a montage, and this is, again, the episode is going very strange. We're going downhill very fast now. <laughs> Tubbs is leading the Miami PD on a high-speed chase to get arrested. Now, question. <laughs> Does anyone at Bolton State Prison or the prisoners in there Will they ever know? Will they actually see the tape of how Tubbs got arrested? Or would it just be okay if he just showed up on the bus and then he was going to jail? Like, this seems like that would be enough work. Not having Tubbs race 100 miles an hour down the expressway, have two police officers chase him and put them in harm's way, and then they arrest him at gunpoint. Yeah, what if he got shot? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, like, nowadays, man, they just shoot his ass. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're right. We talked about it. Like, they could have easily just, like, picked him up. But I guess, like, in the vein of doing super undercover, you don't know how high up it goes. Maybe the guards on the bus are in. The guards on the bus work for the But prison. he asked. So, so. They work for the prison, not the highway patrol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't know. I'm pretty sure the guy parked outside the toll booth doesn't work for the prison. <laughs> he does too. No, he has to. They have to arrest him and send him to regular jail. Then he has to go to court. And then yeah, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Then he has to go. Then they have to put him onto the bus to go to prison. He has to be sent him to the wrong prison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what that's we we did talk about that. Like, what if they don't send him to Bolton? Where all they had to do otherwise was just forge a bunch of paperwork and stuff him on the bus to Bolton. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> but that that would have made too short an episode. All right, we need. <laughs> the high speed chase. <laughs> Whoops. So the montage kind of continues because it goes from the chase to when Tubbs is on the bus. Now, credit to Miami Dade County. They got Tubbs arrested in jail before a judge plead <laughs> arraignment. All in one day. All while he's wearing the same suit. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't even change yeah. his clothes. Yeah. They're fast. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure they got to process you before they stick you on that bus. But I don't know. I mean, I've only, yeah, exactly. I don't, think I don't you have go near in. next to the history of, of jail time. So, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> based on TV I mean, watching, the three of us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> The guards come up, they walk around on the bus, and they go to Tubbs. His name is Cubera. His undercover name is Cubera in this episode. And they just look at him, and then he walks back. The guard walks back and makes a phone call and says, they, we got one. Which is, okay, like, what on the paper said that <laughs> he went and looked through the file. He didn't talk to anybody else. He went directly up to Tubbs and was like, you Cubera? And he's like, yep, okay. Just gets off the bus. Get, goes like, okay, send them on their way. I don't understand. Like, see, we, we don't get to see what's on the paper, but I'm sure it was something like Cubera, drug arrests. <laughs> okay, he's yeah, the one. That, that's got to be what it is. It must be like they're that you're supposed to put together that they arrested him for drugs. Yeah, he's like some mega drug lord. And he, yeah, and he's like high roller because he's wearing the clothes, and the other guys mm -hmm. look like schlobs, and they're just coming. Like, I yeah. don't know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, so once again, once again, what? Why was the high speed? chase necessary if he's in there for drugs i don't know <laughs> yeah you're right he should have been out there like dealing drugs <laughs> yeah i, I mean know. you know they seem to be able to coordinate that stuff too i mean they can do that easy yeah, yeah. they know this guy named Cooper. i, I don't know like i mean it, it almost seems like it almost seems like he should have been arrested by vice cops but how, who what kind of vice cops would they get <laughs> yeah, they I know. why did they have like just white tech and zito bring them in <laughs> no because they're part of his entourage oh that's right i forgot yeah they wear pink suits and drive them around <laughs> what was gina doing today <laughs> i mean trudy had to be his wife so you know we're gonna start going downhill real fast now they get pulled into the prison and they Immediately, Tubbs is being harassed by Lawrence Fishburne. So who saw that yes. coming? I know. <laughs> I know. Larry Fishburne. John, can you tell us all? Because I'm just going to call him Larry for the rest of the I episode. I was calling <laughs> yes. him Larry. Okay. So Larry Fishburne began his career at 12. Guess what, guys? He started out on a soap opera also. <laughs> uh, 
he started out on One Life to Live. Wow. So uh, he also appeared in several TV shows early on. Trapper John, MD, Ash, Kiwi's yep. Playhouse, where he played Cowboy Curtis. Yep. He played Dr. Langston on CSI from 2009 to 2011, which is probably like his most notable TV role as of late. But his movie list is incredibly Im- impressive. You've got Apocalypse Now. You've got Death Wish 2 color purple the matrix movies he produced mission impossible 3 probably wishes people would forget that <laughs> he was also in contagion which is a very underrated movie he was in boys in the hood and me and dominic's favorite favorite the event horizon yes so oh. i'm gonna also say he was also in several recent movies that i didn't realize he was in the movie predators which is the newest predator movie that had adrian brody in it yeah, and that went downhill real fast. He was also in Batman vs. Superman and The Man of Steel. He was also in the newest John Wick movie. So here's a few fun facts about him. He was in three music videos, including Houdini's Growing Up, the 1986 <laughs> song. Oh my god, I know that song. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was in that music video. He was the voice of the Silver Surfer in the Fanta- in Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. Was a voice actor in two CSI video games and three <laughs> Matrix video games, <laughs> as well as a, as well as a Spider Man video game. Also, his daughter's a porn star. I was I was thinking that right when you said it, but like, don't bring that up. Like, <laughs> don't bring up the fact that his daughter's a porn star. Don't be the one that says it. <laughs> Scott, throw that out there. <laughs> well, Larry. Larry. <laughs> <Poor> Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Larry is harassing Tubbs. They get his mug shot. Then Fox comes in and he picks four of them for D block. And that includes, obviously, Cubera. So Tubbs follows prison etiquette. He beats someone up on his first day. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because this guy named Hammer comes down. So he's the head of the Aryan. He says that his cell is Aryan property. Tubbs then punches out Hammer's bodyguard. But then Samson of the Brotherhood comes over and stops them. And then Larry gets involved. It's like, is there a problem over here? So up until then, the guards were just going to keep letting it happen and let Tubbs get beat up. And then we jump really fast to the kitchen where, where Tubbs has been assigned kitchen detail. And 30 seconds, not even 30 seconds, 10 seconds into it, is the guy he's with is like, all right, see ya. And then the, the Aryans come in and jump Tubbs. So in a span of like two minutes of film time, Tubbs gets off the truck, gets harassed by Fishburne, gets his m- mugshot taken, gets harassed by Hammer, gets helped out by the Brotherhood, the, has a yelling match about what their secret, not necessarily secret plans, but like what the problems are between the, the Brotherhood and the Aryans, and then goes into the kitchen and gets jumped. This is getting out of control really fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, so basically he, he, he beats someone up, the Brotherhood claims him as their booty, <laughs> um, and then he gets almost gang raped. He, he should be glad it wasn't like Zucchini Alfredo Day because I'd be worried about what they would, <laughs> where that scene was going to lead. So, and then because then Larry, as soon as he gets beat up, Larry comes in. He puts his foot on his chest and he's like, "Hey, you should be listening to us. We know about you. You can get your, you can buy your way into protection from the guards if you get us two keys." And Tubbs is. Like, uh, no, I don't want to talk to you. You sound like a chump. I want to talk to your daddy. Yeah, let me see your daddy. Yeah. He's the one that makes the deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then Larry's like, you're going to go back into general. Then they're going to go put him out in the yard. But there's a common thing here. As John has found out that it sounds like the entire Cincinnati Bengals team is in this prison. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Close. Actually, it's more like the Miami Dolphins. So... <laughs> Well, of course. <laughs> we have uh, actually three former NFL football players. We have A.J. Dune, who's playing Hammer, who is a former Dolphins linebacker. He was Rookie of the Year in 77. And his claim to fame is in 1982. In the championship game, he intercepted New York Jets quarterback Richard Todd three times, taking one back for a touchdown to send the Dolphins into Super Bowl 17, where they mm. lost to the Redskins. <laughs> <laughs> Where they lost. So, <laughs> speaking of Super Bowls and Dolphins, we all the mo- uh, we also have Jim Kick, who is probably the most famous football player in the episode. He was known as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. 
him and Larry Zonka because they were part of the perfect 1973 uh, Miami Dolphins team. Only team to go completely undefeated and win the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. They won Super Bowl seven, beating the Redskins. Okay. Our last football player is John Corker, who was an NFL and USFL linebacker. He was drafted by the Oilers, played two years, played for a few teams in the USFL, which also failed, and then ended up bouncing around between a few teams before retiring. What an odd episode for there to be three former NFL players to show up in. So they like legitimately put them in that episode because they were yeah. Miami Dolphins, and people must have known who they were when they were in those... I guess so. Right? I mean, definitely kick. But I don't know about the other guys. But I think well, it, it can't be a coincidence that they're uh, Miami players and they put them in there, though. Yeah. Now Tubbs is being thrown out back into general, so he's going to go out in the yard. And Tubbs is now starting to have that look like, I don't like it here in Oz anymore. Well, he's all beat <laughs> up. Out. Like, he's been in there for, like, what, an hour? And like <laughs> He's already been beat up. <laughs> There's a quick scene where he's back downstairs. A man talks, his roommate talks to Tubbs, says, hey, I need you to hook me up with a key. Otherwise, the guards are going to kill me. And Tubbs it's like fuck off. <laughs> oh, no, you're, I'm missing like, the very, you're missing the very best part of that be, that scene. It starts out with the guards being very specific. We need a five six, a uh, five foot six Latino, a <laughs> six foot tall black guy, and a six foot six white guy with blonde hair. <laughs> well, yeah, because remember earlier in the show they talk about when he's undercover. That's how he can get pulled out. Mm. Like if he volunteers, like you can volunteer to go be in the lineup. And they will ask, like, there was some kind of, they were going to ask, ask for something very specific, and he would know, like, okay, I'm supposed to go to this lineup mm. or something. Like, they had talked about that. Okay. Ron Perlman had said that, but you could I, do this. I was trying to figure out why is their height important, and why does the white guy have to have blonde hair? <laughs> Because if you're doing a lineup, right? Like they're they want very, you to- they're very sp- specific to be the only Latin person in the episode, Tubbs and yes. Hammer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tubbs also finds a comb on his bed. <laughs> Fancy Hammer comb. says, why do you got my comb? And he's like, here, I don't want it. I don't know why I don't even got here. And he's like, I'll come get it when I'm ready. It's a very weird conversation. <laughs> <It was> weird. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. Tubbs got looking at his face uh, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, and the lad guy's like, hey, man, I'll do dirty stuff for Coke. <laughs> it's just getting weird in the prison now. <laughs> in the guard's office, Larry is talking to Fox. Fox wants to know what's happening with Cubera because he knows that he's supposed to be a quote unquote big time dealer. Larry says that Cubera has a problem, but he could make them rich. So we're going to continue to work with them. Just know that he's being a pain in the ass right now. Out in the yard, Cubera is walking with his cell roommate, and he, the cell his cell roommate is telling him that all the guards also work for Fox. So you have to watch out for those guys. Hammer comes over to talk to, to Tubbs. Talk. <laughs> to, to, talk. to talk. And Samson comes over too. Now this is where you got to feel bad for Samson. Samson comes over and says that he's... Per- Hammer asks what, Samson why he's per- protecting him. And Samson says it's the will of God. And then the, one of the guards from the tower shoots and kills Samson. Because Yeah, because Samson was protecting him. And that's yeah. what they're trying to do. They mm-hmm. were trying to push him, right? To deal, to push tubs the deal and then we ramp the weirdness up one of the brotherhood says it is the work of allah and then a guard comes out in a gas mask puts a baton on tubs neck and says the boss wants to see you yeah, yeah what the the hell's gas mask about <laughs> we were saying the same thing <laughs> I don't, the only thing i can think is that maybe because like someone was shot like that's standard protocol or like, they didn't want the people in general to know who they were yeah, that's true. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Which of the guards they were. I don't know. I don't know. Just, just, they're just <laughs> randomly shooting. Like they, They're just shooting inmates like fish. Like, like oh, oh, shoot that one now. And then the dude with the gas mask. Like, that's just so random. None of this makes sense. And then we go into this next scene, and it's like, hi, I'm Fox. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, Fox. I know. I know. <laughs> Here's all the dirty guards involved. This is Billy. This is Steve. <laughs> Billy, you now you take real good care of him. Let him use the phone. <laughs> and I love the bargaining too. Tubbs says you get forty percent, and then he the other guy's back, and they're like, okay, uh, here's the deal. I it's fifty fifty, and I want a veggie burger every second Friday. <laughs> yeah, my no. silk sheets and my robe and my lobster. Yeah, and my lady. Yeah. He wants his woman. <laughs> yes. So now the deal's done, Fox, and Fox even said, like, let's do a trial run, it'll be your stuff, but you can just use my name. 
Gwen Thomas Fox. Like that, that that's who's doing yeah, the Yeah, he's my name. Like, okay. <laughs> How do you think you understand how this works? <laughs> Tubbs makes the call into the precinct, and Switek is who's supposed to be like one of his office people, and they set up the deal for two keys. And now Tubbs has done his job. He's set up this deal, so now they'll be able to start to bring down this ring as long as he can survive. Yes. They walk him back to a cell, and they see that his cell roommate has, quote-unquote, committed suicide. Well, they're taking him. It should be noted. Oh, he's just hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> it should be noted they're taking him to a special wing of D-Block mm-hmm. that is for people. I don't know. What, they, what did they say? Like administrative something? I don't know. Protection or something like that? So it's for people that are that are cooperating with them, and they they separate them out, and that's why he's going to get his silk sheets and his radio and his mm-hmm. lobster. Because no that. one else is going to be able to see it. And then he opens the door, and then that guy, his room is hanging there. He's like, "Oh, don't worry, we'll get this all cleaned up for you." Yeah, he needs a little bit of cleaning. Yeah. Like, so now we go to the best part of the episode: Trudy's conjugal visit to Tubbs. <laughs> <laughs> I told you early on. I'm like, no, we haven't got to the best part yet. When Trudy makes the conjugal visit, Trudy shows up, and she's supposed to be. So the deal here is that Cubera. His wife is going to show up with two keys, and that's what Fox's team is going to take to go make the deal. Also, a picture of who they're going to deal with. And then, separately, so what the what the vice team are going to do is that Trudy's going to come in as being his wife, going to bring, going to bring the keys. Then, Switek is going to show up like he's his assistant with a basket with all the other stuff that Tubbs asked for. So, the, the robe and the silk sheets and the lobster and all the other crap that he asked for. So, Trudy shows up. The B team are going to stay outside. Trudy walks in, hands her bag to Larry. Larry says to Fox, hey, in a separate room, let me do this deal. So, Larry's going to go take the deal and go deal with Burnett. That's who where where he's going to go get his two keys. Sorry. So, the, so it, does, it, it doesn't have the, the two keys in it. It just has a picture of who they're supposed to go meet. Then Trudy goes in and sees Tubbs. Now she's concerned for Tubbs. He's way beat up. She sits down, looks at his face, and Tubbs says, hey, we should act like we're married. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she na- goes in to act like they're married. <laughs> so naturally, that means to Tubbs that he accuses Trudy of chumping around on him. <laughs> Right away, it goes from like, "Hey, we should we should be married" to like, "You're chumping on me. You're making a chump out of me." I don't know how many other ways can you say chumping. And and while they're arguing, I I don't know if you does, but Trudy Tennant goes, "Does this mean we're not gonna kiss? That you're not gonna kiss me?" Yeah, I know. Tubbs uses the word "chump" like 15 times in this argument. (laughs) You're playing me like a chump. You're chumping around on me. (laughs) You're choking out. He's using it like like <laughs> like in Rick and Morty, like you're squanching. <laughs> it just means whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> or you're smurfing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I really smurfed that up. <laughs> it is my favorite tub sign ever. You're chomping out on me. <laughs> Are you chomping around on me? <laughs> Outside, the B team sees that Larry's leaving with the picture to go meet up with Bur- with Burnett. So Zwitek then walks up. He does his part, which is to deliver the basket of the other items. I don't know why they actually had to go you through with this. You forgot about the body, though. That happens first, yeah. right? Yeah. So they're bringing the body, the body out. Yeah. They're bringing the bo- they're bringing a body out in a body bag. Zwitek's going to go up to the main gate. He's going to deliver the basket that's supposed to go to Cubera. At the same time, our one eyed friend Carl who set up the, the deal with Samson. So Samson would offer protection to Q, to Tubbs while he's in there. He comes pulling up and he's like, is that Samson? Is that Samson's? Is that Samson in that body bag? You, Switek, the police officer, says he's a police officer. I knew I shouldn't have trusted you. You got my best friend killed. And now, so that means now the guards inside Bolton State Prison know that Switek is a just cop. Just learn how to read. <laughs> So now they know that Switek is a cop and he's delivering stuff for Cubera. So therefore, Cubera is a cop. This is now it's it's hit the fan. Also, yeah, and now this this no, whole next part makes zero sense at the after this because now they know that the cops are involved. They're suspicious that they they know Tubbs is a cop, but we're just gonna leave them in jail and go regroup back at the station in the jail where they're just killing inmates randomly, just shooting them. Yeah, you know? they could just as easily just go in there and bust it down. Like, not to say bust anyone, but just show up and say, yep, we're cops. We're, we're pulling our cop out. They yeah, could. but they could, but he, they could kill him before. The whole the whole point is that they, he, he could be murdered before they could get in there. Because mm-hmm. they had to get through those doors, right? The, the doors. They had to get through the doors. What I was going to say is, how did he know? How did we know that wasn't the other guy that hung himself? I thought that's who that was in that body bag. I thought yeah. it was the roommate. 
So then when they start saying, I'm like, oh, yeah, Samson died today, too. <laughs> How do we know that wasn't him? Well, I think it's just because Carl shows up in a hearse. Like he's going with the funeral home oh. to go pick up Samson's body. So how did he find out so quick? I don't know. Doesn't Samson have family? <laughs> the other common factor here is that once again, Switek is the one breaking people's cover. Switek messes yes. everything up. <laughs> and look at Zito. He's doing so good. He's being all professional looking like a <laughs> regular cop in his regular clothes and he's not an idiot so now we're to the last two scenes of the episode they're gonna have the deal where crockett and castillo and team and gina are gonna bring down larry then what they're gonna do is they're gonna use larry to then basically sneak back into the prison so i'm gonna breeze through this deal section really fast they bust larry comes in he sees the picture uh, he sees that it's who Burnett is supposed to be, who's the only person in the whole restaurant. So it should have been pretty easy to identify him. Mm-hmm. They arrest Larry. They have Larry make a call to the prison to say, I'm coming back. The deal was a bust. No one was here. But don't kill that cop until I show up. But Fox is like, no, we're going to kill Q- Cubera at 3 p.m. <laughs> He's very <What>? punctual. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Larry's like, yeah, yeah, no. Don't kill him. I want to be there when you kill him. Like it's some big special event, you know? Like, like, come on, let let, let me pull the trigger. Yeah, he's just saying, like, I won't be able to get back in because it'll be too much commotion with you Mm -hmm. killing him and all that. It'll be too too suspicious or whatever. Yeah. And then Castillo says, Crockett, you're not going in. Too many people are going to recognize you. I'm going to sneak in as a prisoner. It's not really sneaking. He only gets through one door, basically. He would have to. (laughs) But Castillo is going to go in and save Tups. So now they're up against the clock. They know they have to be there by 3 p.m. They're going to use Larry to get into the prison with Castillo hidden as a prisoner. So now we're going to go to Bolton State Prison and go for our final scene. Now, I just want to stop for one second. And Melissa, you had some questions about what the picture that they that Tubbs gave or that <laughs> Trudy gave <laughs> To Larry yeah, to well, be asking, able to identify that I he's wonder Burnett. What, the, what picture was it of like of Crockett? I want to see the picture. Like, was it a picture of him like lounging <laughs> on his boat with his arm around <laughs> Elvis, or was it like a, was it like a snapshot of like uh, Crockett in bed with some coffee drinking? Like, <laughs> do they have stock pictures they give people like undercover pictures where he's got I his, guess they would. like leaning against the Lamborghini? Or something? I don't know what's going on. He's on his Don boat. Johnson headshots, you know, of him <laughs> yes. and Burnett. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like his calling card. He's got like a, a thing of Coke in his hand. <laughs> so well, over I, just, I love when, when they when they're getting Castillo ready, they give him a, a vest and Swartek's like, This probably won't work against their guns, so or <laughs> good luck. You know, and yeah, good luck and hopefully they don't shoot you in the head, you know. So you might and also duck. Nobody's surprised that when he took off his shirt, he was wearing a V-neck, right? No. <laughs> a V-neck white t-shirt. Oh, oh yeah. He... Larry is able to get Castillo inside, gets him to the front door. And then when they get to the main doors to go into the into the blocks, Larry just runs through the door, then leaves Castillo locked in this little this little entryway. Inside... Castillo just kicks it. <laughs> I know. I'm like, what kind of prison is it? You can just kick the door. <laughs> What's that going to do? You don't think any prisoners ever tried that before? <laughs> also, Larry did not know that Castillo is a ninja. And so no. he thought he was just going to run away and leave him out there and nothing was going to happen. Yeah, ninja kick. You have Castillo in his element. Yeah. He can pull a samurai sword and chop the door down. <laughs> What's happening with Tubbs is that he's out in the general area. The, the, the plan is from Fox is that they're going to stage his death. They planted a knife on him. Then they'll have one of the tower guards shoot and kill him and then say it was because he was attacking another prisoner and then Tubbs will be dead. Throwing him out into the yard. Tubbs obviously very nervous. And then all the commotion starts because Castillo gets into one room with this gigantic handgun. We, we, we get a Yeah, he gets to the one room. We get a quick scene that Castillo's like wandering around lost. And then, <laughs> then he decides he's going to blow some shit up. <laughs> Collects a propane tank. Puts it up against the door to the yard and and blows the door up and then just all hell breaks loose. He just comes through the mist of the smoke too, like something out of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. A tower guard. Tries I love to the sh- guy on top, the guard that's shooting. He doesn't know. Do I shoot at Tubbs? Do I shoot at the guy that just blew the door off of the kitchen? <laughs> that guy ends up trying to shoot Tubbs, but Tubbs get, uses a prisoner as a bodyguard and then as a body shield, and then he takes the bullet. Castillo shoots another one in the tower. 
Eventually, Larry, he gets Tubbs. They start trying to work their way out. Larry comes out. Tubbs judo chops him in the neck and takes Larry down. And then the Aryans and the Brotherhood come out together with Fox and Hammer. And they've beaten them up really bad. Then they continue to beat him, like jump him in the yard as together. The unity of the Brotherhood and the Aryans. They came together to murder. They they came together to murder Fox and Hammer. And can we talk about the Tubbs and Castillo just watch? Like, yeah. they don't stop it. <laughs> no. Uh-huh. They just watch it happen. And at the end, they're like, yeah, that was what happens. Like, you know, that's what happens. The trial by your peers. <laughs> there is just so much wrong with this last scene. Number one, how is this place not in, like, full riot mode right now? Mm-hmm. Number two, they are arresting all of the guards on an active prison with prisoners. Like, yes. Like, what? What are you? How, what are you gonna do? You gotta ship all these damn prisoners all, all over the damn place now while you hire new guards. Also, like, they're just indiscriminately this- shooting guards. Not all the guards were mixed up in this. Yeah, no, there was only like they acted like there was only a handful of guards that were actually in on it. Then who? I thought it was only the D block, the whatever, yeah, D block guards that were in it. So uh-huh. what are the other ones? That, <laughs> you just yeah. murdered all these other people yeah. who were just actually working as guards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then Castillo like takes a bullet in the vest, so apparently the vest does work, but no <laughs> holes in Castillo's shirt. By the way, <laughs> the vest works so well that it didn't even penetrate the shirt. And then it's just like it's just utter chaos. It, it, when Tubbs tackles Larry, he, I mean, that is just like the, the, Tubbs fights like a girl. Like, that was just <laughs> a sad fighting scene on the ground. Come on. Well, and then in the last <laughs> moment, Switek comes running over with a shotgun to tell everyone to back off. You see that Fox and Hammer have been beaten to death. And most like you said, Tubbs says at least they got a trial from their peers. And then the episode's over. So I think, I think we have many more final thoughts. So we should save those for <laughs> yeah, the final thoughts. Because this episode was a train wreck in the last half. Let's go over and talk about this music, though, because there's some interesting artists that appeared in here. All right, John, this week's music is actually a little bit different than normal. We have a big name song, a, b- a band that we've covered before, and then a song that's in like every 80s action movie. So what do you got for us this week? All right. We're going to get started with Listen Like Thieves by NXS. We've already talked about them. We already talked about them in depth. I mean, there's just not a ton. I tried to just focus on on the song itself, and there's not a ton there. Listen Like Thieves is on the album of the same name. It was released in 86. It was big at the time. It was their fifth studio album, number 11 on the Billboard Top 200. They recorded it over three months at Rhinoceros Studios in Sydney, Australia. Yes, Rhinoceros Studios. (laughs) Yes, that exists. A band called Was, Not Was, which was a U.S. pop duo, covered the song on their 92 album, Hello Dad, I'm in Jail. (laughs) To give you an idea of Was, Not Was, just one excerpt I pulled from their Wikipedia stated, The eclectic album Born to Laugh at Tornadoes in 1983 had even more guest musicians, featuring Ozzy Osbourne rapping over electro music. Okay. Yes. Kind of hope was, not was, ends up in the music at some point. (laughs) I'd like to read more about that. Uh, Let's jump to Walk This Way by Run DMC. Obviously, Run DMC are um, uh, hip-hop pioneers from Queens, New York. They were founded by Joseph Simmons, who is the younger brother of Russell Simmons, the founder of F Jam. They were all the other the other members were named Daryl McDaniels and Jason Mizell. Joseph Simmons was also known as Reverend Run by most people. McDaniels as DMC or Easy D and Jason Mizell as Jam Master J. I mean, they're just they were the first rap group with a gold album. They were the first rap group nominated for a Grammy. They were the first rap group to have a platinum album. The first rap group to have a multi-platinum album. I mean, they pioneered the fusion of hip-hop and hard rock. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think that this song, Walk This Way, because they covered an Aerosmith song, is the beginning of that. But actually, their song, Rockbox, 1984, was the beginning of the fusion of hip-hop and hard rock. And it was the first ever rap video played on MTV. Ah. They also revolutionized the way that rappers dress. Uh, up to the point of Run DMC, 
most drafters dress really extravagantly, you know, big hats and chains and all this other stuff. They came out and they were the first ones to wear like leather jackets. And they, I mean, they made Adidas huge, mm-hmm. so big that they actually got an endorsement deal from Adidas. They were featured in the Crush Groove movie, which is actually a fictional movie kind of about Russell Simmons' journey starting Def Jam. Featured other artists. Uh, so first of all, Blair Underwood plays Russell Simmons in that. It also features other rap artists, Curtis Blow, Fat Boys, who were also in Vice, Mm -hmm. LL Cool J, and the Beastie Boys as well. Curtis Blow, actually, Joseph Simmons was a DJ for Curtis Blow because Curtis Blow was Russell Simmons, one of his first rappers that he produced. Son was his DJ and actually was often referred to as Son of Curtis Blow. Ah. The most successful album was Raising Hell, which this this song is on, which was the first album that Rick Rubin produced for them. Rick Rubin also, in 1988, directed uh, uh, Tougher Than Lead, which was inspired by the album of the same name, which is a would-be crime caper featuring Slick Rick and Beast and the Beastie Boys, and the movie bombed in box offices. <laughs> Going into the 90s, it did not start well for Rick. DMC. Back From Hell was their worst reviewed album ever. Easy D started having issues with his drinking and Master J was involved in a life-threatening car accident and then survived two gunshot wounds in another incident. Uh-huh. And Simmons was charged with raping a college student in Ohio. Though wow. those charges were eventually dropped. Wow. Yeah. Simmons and McDaniels would find God and would move on. Jam Master J would found JMJ Records and is credited as discovering the group Onyx, whose big single was Slam. I remember and them. 50 Cent. He's got one. Yeah. I'll give him that. He's got one. <laughs> Run would become an ordained minister and eventually have a reality TV show on MT- MTV called Run's House that was on from 2005 to 2009. And then his wife and him would team up with Kool-Aid and a non-profit Kaboom to build playgrounds in underserved communities. And they've built 24 since 2008 and counting. Nice. Jam Master J, on the other hand, on October 30th, 2002, Jam Master J was shot and killed at his recording studio in Queens. It is still unsolved today. And it is actually the Tupac and Biggie kind of murders, mm. you know. Easy D would continue making music and actually be the center of a VH1 show called My Adoption Journey in 2008 after he found out late in life that he was adopted. They were inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame of Nine, and there is talks of making a Run DMC biopic pick, and 50 Cent has also talked about making a documentary just on Jam Master J. Well, yeah, he's like rap royalty, so... Yeah. Our next song is Gear Jammer by George Thurgood and the Destroyers. This is another one where we've kind of talked about George Thurgood before. Obviously known for songs Bad to the Bone, I Drink Alone. His style of music's uh, Chicago Blues. And, you know, I, I was also noticing doing a little more research that, you know, some of their other hit songs like Move It On Over was a Hank Williams cover, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Who Do You Love, that song, was a reworked Bo Diddley song. Ah. In the early 70s, Thurgood worked as a roadie for Hound Dog Taylor and found his mainstream success as a supporting band for the Rolling Stones during one of their tours. Wow. He also played SNL Saturday Night Live in 82. And the Thurgood and the Destroyers once played 51 shows in 50 days, playing all 50 states. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. Our last song is In Dolce Decorum by the band The Damned. The Damned, and luckily The Damned is going to be featured in fu- future episodes. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about them more. I say luckily because they're actually kind of interesting. They were the first UK punk band to release a single. They beat the Sex Pistols by five weeks. Oh. 
They you were know, the and first that, that UK... say that they have a very similar sound to yeah. like what would come out of the UK during the British invasion in the, in the 80s, like the late yeah. 70s into so, the 80s. They were formed in 76. They were the first UK punk band to release an album and the first UK punk band to tour the US. They're commonly referred to as the band of firsts because of <laughs> this stuff. And really like that's if it wasn't for the Clash and the Sex Pistols, like, I feel like the Sex Pistols in the clash like overshadowed the damned a lot because the dams their, their popularity was very up and down but they played and the, they played with a lot of people they had a lot of different members of the band at one point in time who went on the other stuff like at one point in time they there was a version of the dam that featured lemmy from motorhead oh weird i'll get more into their history as a band later all i'm gonna do is leave you with who they are and a little bit about them on vocals we have Dave Vanian, who was born Dave Lett, Van- changed it to Vanian, uh, as in Transylvanian. And Dave previously worked as a grave digger before his music career. <laughs> we have the guitarist Brian James. James played in Iggy Pop's solo touring band in 1979. So he also played with a bunch of people, but we'll talk about that in future episodes. On bass and guitar, we have Captain Sensible. <laughs> Yes, Captain Sensible, who was born Raymond Burns. Captain Sensible, first musical instrument was a Bon Tempe organ. And in 06, he founded Britain's Blah Party, oh, uh, which, okay. yes, they are they consider themselves a party of protest. And just to quote the article, a channel through which the people of the UK can vent their dissatisfaction at nonsensical everyday things. One of their policies included making John Prescott, at the time the Deputy Prime Minister, lose weight. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> yes. And then we have their drummer, Rat Scabies. Rat was their... Scabies. Rat Scabies, yes. <laughs> uh, was born Christopher Miller. He's a career drummer and the central character of the book, Rat Scabies and the Holy Grail, written by former musical journalist Christopher Dawes in 05, and is billed as a road trip, a rich historical yarn, and a testimony to the odd nature of, many, of a great many friendship. Mm. So we will talk about them again and how they connect to the tenders and and many more <laughs> this was quite a different music selection than previous seasons we knew something like this was coming i've definitely noticed a turn in the music things have changed they've gone to a lot more what was popular as far as albums released at the time and and gone with much more bigger named people we don't have these people who are sliding in these small bands that are sliding in that were kind of niche contributors you mm-hmm. know we're, we're, we're talking about george thurgood and we're talking about run dmc you know just like these big names well let's go cap this episode off with our final thoughts because i don't think we're gonna be friendly all right, guys, I'm going to kick off this week. I have a major problem with this episode. I'm not going to go into too much ranty detail about my problems with this episode. It's just season three has been going so well. It's been going so fantastic. And this episode was great. It was just great for the wrong reasons because it went vice. It was a vice, normal vice episode. And then Tubbs goes to jail and we get on the silly train and we stay on the silly train until the episode ends. I did appreciate seeing Izzy as a stripper. I always love it when Izzy's <laughs> on the episode anyway. So it was great mm-hmm. seeing him in cheetah print pants and playing the air guitar. But otherwise, this episode was forgettable. It was funny with Tubbs. But I, like I said in the beginning, this should have been a two-part episode. Backstory on him and Laura, their burgeoning relationship, a tragic accident. Then Tubbs and Crockett start investigating someone. Tubbs then decides to go infiltrate a prison ring. And episode one. The second part of the episode is Tubbs in jail. It's a longer stretch. We kind of turn it into a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie like Death Warrant, where he's then in jail. Yeah, it's like the total yeah. script of that. Yeah, <laughs> Only, of course, Jean-Claude Van Damme does it better. No. Then he's in jail for a longer period of time. They try and break through, or Tango and Cash, maybe. More like Tango and Cash, they try and break this crime ring, but they're in jail, and they're in over their heads, and have Crockett and Tubbs go in, and then have this nice, nice long story. So I, 
I feel like the story was there. It just didn't deliver. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Everyone should be fired. <laughs> Fire everybody. <laughs> this is just this, the 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 prison should be in a riot. Like this is just insane. You just arrested all of the guards. You either arrested or murdered all of the guards at a freaking prison. How is this not scandal? How is this? <laughs> the governor should just fire everybody. What are you guys thinking? How is this not planned out better? Tubbs should have been killed. Everything happened so quick for the in the first day, and then they leave him in there for like two more days to just get just get whacked. <laughs> while they know he's a cop, while they're having a team meeting, I knew there had to be an episode like this eventually. It's like mm-hmm. everything's going so good. Like, there's going to be a hiccup. There's got to be a hiccup here somewhere. And then to top it all off, the freaking girlfriend, Laura, is uncredited. <laughs> and That's what's really making him mad. <laughs> yes! She even has a speaking part. Aren't you supposed to credit people with speaking? She, she talks in the episode. She was even has sex in the episode. Looking? <laughs> yeah. How is a girl that good looking just not that rememberable that you don't credit, credit her? I, I just, she could have disappeared. She had been like in the music video or something else. <laughs> it's not like she went to work for Kiko's or or <laughs> the Olive Garden. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, clearly, I don't have as strong of feelings about this episode as everyone else. <laughs> like, I mean, I didn't think it was a good episode. It was a bad episode. It was very humorous. <laughs> it made no sense. <laughs> I don't know what to think about this episode. It was l- less Crockett than I like to see in an episode too. <laughs> so there's that. We've all said it. Maybe it would have been better if it was a two-parter. I don't know. I just think it's just not a good episode. And maybe like if it was in season two, we'd be like, oh, this isn't that bad. But so far, we've been going so good. And I know what the rest of season three is. Spoiled. Three. We've been spoiled yeah. so far in season three. Yeah. And I know what the rest of season three is. So I'm like, eh. I don't <laughs> It's not the, you know, whatever. It's not terrible, but it. Definitely goes, I think it was just too much information, trying to cram it in there. Mm -hmm. That's what they were doing. I mean, but we did get to see Trudy do a conjugal visit. (laughs) And we did get to see (laughs) Izzy take off his pants to reveal a different (laughs) pair of pants. But other than that, that was it. There was nothing good in this. Oh, I, I mean, Castillo do a little bit of mini ninja stuff. Not yeah. not full on, though. Castillo, no. some, dad has to step in sometimes to take care of business. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, they're all that- fired. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, John took this episode harder than everyone else. <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what you think. Should everyone be fired? <laughs> Should there be a whole new prison system built for Miami-Dade County? Should we find out who Laura really is, John? <laughs> so he can sleep tonight knowing? I got a list of like 10 people who are uncredited, who are just lost forever. <laughs> no one will ever know. Email us. Let us know if you found anything, especially on Manny. Go with the <laughs> well, heat at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to check out the website, goalwiththeheat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe to the show. If you're listening to us right now, please go to your podcast platform of choice and give us a review. It'll help people with finding the show. We appreciate you listening. We would love to hear from you. Be sure to check out the show if you'd like to listen to it on YouTube or TuneIn or Stitcher. You can pretty much find us anywhere fine podcasts are found. That's going to do it for us this week, and we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye.